Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Seewald, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the topic of leading innovation in a world filled with disruption. Now, you may be a leader of a small company. You may be a manager in a large organization. You could be an entrepreneur, but we all face the similar challenge of needing to innovate. And the thing is, innovation, it's hard. It's hard. Any person who tells you innovation is easy has never done it themselves. So you see, the challenge that we face is that we need to not just innovate and come up with breakthroughs and keep up with the disruptors, but we also need to keep the lights on. We need to keep the business going. And that is one of the fundamental challenges of being a leader, leader of innovation. Let me kind of tell you a little bit more about this. Let me introduce you to my friend here, Tony. Now, Tony was the founder, the CEO of one of the largest car services, black car companies in the United States. They were based right where I am in the metro New York area, and they had grown. They had hundreds, thousands of cars in their fleet. And it just so happened that I met Tony a number of years back at a party, and we were just chit-chatting. And I know very little about car services, precious little, but I had read an article in Inc. Magazine not long ago about this new technology, this thing where you could call a car with a driver, not in a taxi, using your smartphone. It sounded totally futuristic. And as I chatted with Tony, and he told me about all the great innovations in his field, he talked about how they're using this auto mechanic service to speed up repairs, and they just built a website that was pretty cutting edge for them. When I told him about this new business model, Tony kind of frowned and said, listen, nobody's going to run us out of business for two reasons. It's all about reliability with your customers and trust and you can't replace that with a new technology. Well, you might know what company that I was referring to, Uber. There's lots of imitators out there, but Tony had never heard of Uber, but just so happens that a couple of years later, I ran into him again. He clearly didn't remember our conversation, but as we were chit-chatting, I asked him, how's business going? As we chatted at this picnic, and he said, ah, it's going terrible. We're down over 30%. Our business is getting killed. We're getting Ubered. And I kind of smiled and said, what does that mean? And he said that there's this new business out there. And all of our trusted, loyal customers, people that we had known and always would call us, they're starting to dabble in using this Uber business and Lyft and others like them. And, you know, Tony's company's still around. They're still a leader. They've lost some business. They've had to try to catch up, but it's been hard. And the reality is, while Tony's business may not be my business or your business, it's the same fundamental challenge that so many companies before have faced. Tony's not a bad leader. Tony's business is not poorly designed. In fact, he did all the things right, all the blocking and tackling. And it brings me to the core problem of innovation for any established organization. It's this, well-managed companies like Tony's, they struggle to innovate because they're well-managed. Well-managed companies struggle to innovate because of the very reason that got them there. They're well-managed, they're well-oiled machines, they're well-designed. Think about Blockbuster Video. Blockbuster Video in the United States and worldwide was a leader in the retail video space. But the thing that got them there is the thing that put blinders over their eyes. They didn't see streaming coming, even when it was introduced to them and was put in their portfolio. They ignored it and said, let's focus on the core. Kodak, one of the aged old stories of innovation gone wrong. They had digital photography in their portfolio 30 years before it really became a mainstay. And why is that? It's because as an organization, they wanted to focus on their core business. Don't get distracted from the new and the innovative. It's a threat of doing things differently. And this is the challenge we all face. 
We all inherently face this because you have to keep the lights on, but if you want to exist, you have to do things differently. So this begs the question, why is it hard for well-managed companies to innovate? What gets in the way? Well, to bring this to life, rather than just me lecture to you, let's play a game. So the game that I'm going to invite us to play is one where you're gonna to have to make a choice. And there is a little bit of a curiosity. I'm gonna be giving you each 10,000 US dollars tax-free. I mean, what, what could be better to come to this talk and listen to this and get all this cash? But hold on, there is a rub. There is a condition. You can't just run off and spend it. What you need to do is invest in one of two companies. And to tell you a little bit more about them, what I want to do is go back in time for a moment to when these two companies, which are real companies, were competing. So company A, before actually I even tell you about company A, let me tell you about 2006 when they, these guys were competing actually, because I want to make sure we're back right in the appropriate frame of context. 2006, where were you? Where was I? Well, I was working a job and I remember there was a bull market here in the United States the stock market was doing great. The real estate market was really kind of inflated right before the crash of 2007, but it was hot times back then. And if you're a soccer fan, you may remember the headbutt heard around the world. Zinedine Zidane from France gave a little bit of a headbutt to Mario Materazzi. Italy ends up winning the World Cup. You may remember that. And oh yeah, Donald Trump was firing people, but only on TV on The Apprentice, not for real. So different times, really different times. All right, well, let's meet the companies now. The two companies, Company A, they were a leader in their own space, but in an adjacent place, established in completely different markets than the market they were competing in. They had very little share at the time. From a leadership standpoint, they push people to do things differently. They're collaborative, but also kind of chaotic. And quite frankly, their past strategic launches have been a bit of a mixture of success and wild failure. So you never know what you're gonna get. Company B, a little bit different. They've been recently established as a leader. They've been building over time. They've outmaneuvered a couple of key players. And from a leadership standpoint, they've kind of gone and grown from within. Vertical structure, if you will. Deep traditions in what they do. And they believe that if you keep improving upon what you've done, you'll get yourself there in the future. So incremental step improvements. So those are your two options to invest. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I want you to think about which company you wanna invest your money in. Is it company A? Is it company B? Or are you ready to run off and put this in a Swiss bank account? No, 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 no option for that. No Swiss bank accounts open for you guys. You have to make a choice, A or B. So take a moment, make that choice. And all right, I think we're ready to reveal. So let's find out how you guys did. First things first, if you invested in company B, you invested in a little company in Canada called Research in Motion, the maker of BlackBerry. You may remember BlackBerry. And if you converted for company A, guess what? You invested in Apple. And if you're just trying to do the math on it, yeah, you voted for BlackBerry, wah, wah. Your $10,000, it's only worth $1,200 now. If you put your money in Apple, it's gone up over six times. But don't worry, if you invested in BlackBerry, you may actually be able to afford the newest BlackBerry or newest iPhone. So not all bad. But you may be thinking, ah, how did I end up losing my money on this? Well, let's go back in time and look at what actually happened in the story of RIM, BlackBerry, and also Apple. So you may remember perhaps having a BlackBerry. I do. Our BlackBerries were signs of status. If you were in the office and you had the newest BlackBerry, it was like having the corner office in a lot of companies. It was a real sign, a signature of having made it because it was such a cool cutting edge device. Here in the United States, 
Even the president, Barack Obama at the time, he had to have special dispensations to have his BlackBerry made available because he couldn't live without it. The keyboard was a game changer. And if you looked at the data at the time around when this case is created, around 06, you'll notice that up here, that BlackBerry kind of took a dip and then started growing, growing, growing as they outflanked their major competitor, which was not the iPhone, but it was actually a thing called the Trio, the Palm. And they kind of didn't do it. But down here, you'll notice there was a little thing called the Apple iPhone. And the company, they thought, well, it's not really a big threat or a big risk. It's kind of a toy. It's for the consumer market. We're serious. We have a keyboard. We're for the corporate marketplace. And that's exactly what this guy, he was the co-CEO at the time, Jim Balsale. That's what he thought. He was so sure that the Apple would never make it. He was so certain that they doubled down on what they'd been doing step by step. And in fact, we have, by the good graces of YouTube, a little bit of a film clip that's still out there from Jim right at the time of this case being interviewed on a Canadian talk show about his view, his perspective about the BlackBerry and the iPhone right at this inflection point. So let's go to the video tape. I'm gonna come over here and in a moment, I'm gonna play it for you. All right, so we are going to go to the video tape. Hey everybody, say hello to Mr. Jim Balsley. Thank you, Jim, man. All right, thank you to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, it's great. Wow. How is it that you have the same one that I have? Shouldn't you uh, have some you, fancy James Bond version? You're, you're living the dream, man. <laughs> doesn't even have a camera. You don't have the camera one. <laughs> How are things going? Things are really good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Did you imagine um, I mean, all the things that have sort of changed in your life in the last 10 or 15 years? Uh, a lot less has changed than you would think, really. A uh, very normal life, kind of. It, it, it's just a whole lot more zeros on everything. Yeah. So. Which is great if the decimal point's in the right place, you know. Uh, the the I mean, where where Rim has gone uh, in the last like you know, did you have a moment where you thought, okay, I think we we've reached like we're here. You know, not a lot really. I don't I don't sort of think that way. I don't I don't sort of look up too much. I don't look down too much. Uh, you know, I just it's the great fun is doing what you do every day. And uh, so yeah, I'm not I'm sort of a poster child for not sort of doing anything but what we do, uh, you know, every day. So. Um, no, I don't really think about it a lot, no. I mean, do you get the sense that at, at this point with what the BlackBerry itself, that device has done for your company, that it's a matter of time before other people, like the iPhone didn't really do it. I mean, like, do you ever look at it and go, what are we going to do if this isn't our primary business, growing rim beyond something like a BlackBerry? Mm, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly die. Yeah. <laughs> That'll just be yeah, it. We're a very poorly diversified portfolio. <laughs> it's like, it, be it's, thing. I mean, it either goes to the moon or it crashes to earth. So, uh, <laughs> but it's making it to the moon pretty good. So sure, totally. We'll stay with it. Wow. No matter how many times I watch that video, hey. I can never get over. Maybe Jim regrets actually having done that. In his words, it either goes to the moon or crashes to the earth. Well, if you know the story, you know exactly what happened. It crashed. And you can see here that they continued in 06 for a while and through 09 being a leader. They held the market for a little while, but here came the iPhone up, 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 up. And eventually if you extended this graph, you would see as of the launch with the BlackBerry storm, which became a telltale story of disaster and misleadership that their market share collapsed. So much so that today they're like a less than 0.1%. They've been gobbled up. They're irrelevant. The biggest leader in the market and they were gone. And this really underscores a really important point here. It's not just to point our finger in the face of somebody who makes a mistake. Mistakes happen. We learn, we test, we learn, we fail. But it's more about the mindset. And I like to think about these as the two corporate innovation mindsets. It's the knower's mindset, which is really emblemized by Jim saying, I don't look up. I don't look down. I'm a poster child for doing what we do every day. We don't change. And if you juxtapose that with Steve Jobs, who was at the helm of Apple, he said something a little bit different. 
Human minds settle into fixed ways of looking at the world. We need to embrace a beginner's mindset. And that is the juxtaposition, the comparison between these two mindsets, the fixed or knower's mindset. What's happened before will happen again. The past predicts the future. Proceed on assumption. That is how Blockbuster and Kodak and Tony and Jim and Blackberry ended up where they are. We want to embrace a learner's mindset. And this is not new advice. If you go back 100 plus years more, this gentleman really nailed it, Mark Twain, when he said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. That is the knower's mindset. We're so certain what we think we know that we ignore sometimes the obvious. We're unwilling to experiment to be a learner. So as a leader, what can you do? What can you do as a leader of innovation to combat the knower's mindset within yourself, within your organization, within your teams? Well, there's three things that I believe you can do as a leader. There are many things, but there are three things I'm going to talk about today. Number one, inspire purpose. Inspire purpose. Purpose creates movements. Movements create innovation. In the words of the great management guru, Peter Drucker from New York University, he famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. But I think he should have gone a step further. He should have said, culture eats strategy for breakfast, but purpose, it eats culture for dinner. Culture matters. Purpose drives people, and it gives a pathway and enables people to innovate. Look no further than this example. Maybe one of the largest, most successful eye care organizations in the world that you probably haven't heard of. It's called the Ayurved Eye Care System. And they have innovated on everything eye care. They are one of the largest, if not the largest, eye care and surgical provider in the world. They've done amazing things. And it all started with this guy, Dr. Venkataswamy, Dr. V. In the 1970s, he was ready to retire. He'd been pensioned off, was stopping working in the area of ophthalmology at a university, and he could have just gone off and played some golf and enjoyed his life. But no, he saw a problem in the world, in particular in India. No non-governmental organization, charitable organization, consulting firm could crack the issue of preventable eye blindness in India. People make so little, on average, a couple bucks a day, and the surgery was a lot more expensive. And even though he was ready to be a pensioner, he stopped and said, we need to do something about this. We need to think differently about this. So he created a purpose, a mission. And he said, our mission is to eradicate avoidable blindness, no matter how rich or poor a person may be. And rather than just putting a platitude out there and creating a purpose, because purpose is important, but there needs to be action behind it, conspicuous action, Dr. V did a number of things that were very unorthodox. He mortgaged his home. He got his siblings to mortgage their homes. They sold jewelry. They got rid of a lot of their prized possessions for cash to invest in Aravind because they believe if you want to create change, if you want to create purpose, you need to put your own backing behind it. So that's just what they did. And what they did with that is that they created the most innovative cutting edge eye care company in the developing world, if not the developed world. They adapted the McDonald's assembly line system and applied it to ophthalmology. They got people from villages to become frontline eye care workers. They took it a step further. They were the earliest experimenters in telemedicine to get to people in the rural areas who couldn't get eye care. And what happened? They transformed the world of eyes all across India and actually well beyond its borders. Over 30 million surgeries performed. Unbelievable. They've revolutionized techniques and technologies that other people haven't. They have the lowest infection rates, lower than many people in the Western world. They have changed the game because there was purpose. There was intention. And above all else, hey, it was recognized. Even Google gave him a homepage on his birthday. So while Dr. V is not with us anymore, his legacy of creating purpose is. 
If you want to create an innovation culture, if you want to be a leader of innovation, start with having a purpose that people believe that's relatable and that you invest in and you conspicuously show. Inspire purpose. It's the first one. Second, create the conditions that enable innovation. What do I mean? Well, again, to borrow the words of Peter Drucker, he said, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. Doing the right things. And there are a few things that you can do straight away that would be very effective. For me, top of the list, the conditions that create innovation are establishing psychological safety. What does that mean? Well, trust is kind of at the foundation. We have trust between two people. We trust our friends. We might trust our boss. We might trust our individual peers. Psychological safety transcends individual trust. It's where we are not afraid to take a risk, to make a mistake, to fail, because we know the group will give us the benefit of the doubt. That's what psychological safety is. Innovation cannot thrive in the absence of psychological safety. And in fact, there was a landmark study on Teams that was done at Google, codename Project Aristotle. Now, Project Aristotle was focused on trying to understand what makes a team successful. And Google studied this. They had a group that was studying this for a number of years, looking at all different factors, demography, education, race, gender, a variety of other factors. And nothing seemed to really be truly predictive, except when teams notably said their leaders created psychological safety. The teams that play together, that have safety together, perform together. So if you want innovation, you cannot have innovation without taking risk. And you won't take risk without psychological safety. So you need, as a leader, to instill that in your folks. Think about Jim. Jim famously said, there's no room for error. Every person should know their job and do their job. Where's the psychological safety there? Well, the aftermath, BlackBerry Storm, I alluded to it earlier, one of the greatest failures that's been noted in case studies for businesses. The iOS failed, there was distribution channels, and people in the company, the engineers, knew it, but they were afraid to speak up. It was a risk. And when there's risk, people will not speak up and do things differently. They won't do things that are innovative. They won't call out things that are going to be disruptors in your business and your process. They just won't do it. Safety matters. So what creates it? Role modeling. Leaders model what they want people to see. Herb Kelleher, this guy was the CEO of Southwest Airlines. If you don't know Southwest Airlines, it is a company that was premised on people. In the words of Herb Kelleher, the business of business is people. And this guy lived it. He role modeled it. Here you could see him handing out peanuts and snacks on flights. He would go and offload luggage off of planes with the baggage handlers. He did everybody's job to show he was not beneath it. And it was important because as a leader, you need to role model, show what good looks like, and to show that you believe in what your people are doing. Just like Dr. V, he mortgaged his past to be able to live a different future. It's all about role modeling, which creates the conditions that also enable psychological safety. And by the way, it doesn't go unnoticed. In fact, his uh, direct reports, his employees worldwide, about 13,000 people came together to contribute money to buy a full page ad, commending him, honoring him as a boss in USA Today magazine or newspaper that is. So role modeling, really important as a leader to do the things we tell people to do and not just talk about it. And Last but not least, celebrating risk-taking and normalizing failure. This is a direct corollary of psychological safety. When you have safety, people normalize risk-taking. While I was at Pfizer and the head of innovation for Pfizer, we had run numerous campaigns about what would you dare to try? What did people do, both successes and failures? Because it was important to be able to socialize the idea of risk-taking to make it acceptable to understand that sometimes you might fail, but you learn from it and iterate. All innovation starts with an idea that just doesn't work. 
because our first ideas are never our best ideas. It's the constant iteration and experimentation that makes an idea or a new venture or a new business successful. Finally, our third characteristic or behavior is about breaking down barriers. As a leader, you have to sometimes break stupid rules. You have to sometimes clear the way for innovation to happen, even though you're not the one that's innovating. So in the words of the great general in the US, his name was Douglas MacArthur. He said, sometimes we just have to break down rules. We get rewarded not for following them, but for breaking the rules. And that is what has to happen as a leader is you have to clear the way and find the maybe foolish rules or the non-traditional rules that are getting in the way of innovation. They're stifling you. Let me talk about breaking traditions for a moment. You may not be an aficionado of spirits and whiskey making, but if you don't know about it, I've only learned about it in rather recent times. It's a pretty regulated, tradition-bound industry, a lot like maybe some of your industries. For example, if you want to create a bourbon, a bourbon requires you to age your whiskey in a barrel, a special barrel, oak aged barrels, for no less than five years. That's a long time. And that's kind of tricky. It's the rules. It's a tradition. You can't break it. Well, this guy, Tom, Tom Licks, he said, well, why do we have to do that? Can we change the rules? Can we break them? So Tom went along and he said, let's see what we can do to try to reinvent this and challenge the basic orthodoxies. So he said, the rule for bourbon making and whiskey is that you have to age it inside oak barrels. So he took the rule and he challenged it lots of different ways. But ultimately the question that came to him is, well, what if instead of putting the whiskey in the barrels, we put barrels inside the whiskey? Now that's absurd, right? But actually by asking these wild questions, by pushing against convention, breaking rules, you do things differently. And that's what Tom did. He actually said, well, how can we make it possible? His team came up with a concept where they broke up the barrels and put the barrels literally inside the whiskey and steel drums, and they applied pressure on it, creating like a saturation effect, like a sponge. And they put pressure on, off, on, off, on, off, again and again, until the barrels absorbed it. And they created a whiskey. Now you may be thinking, Okay, they created a whiskey, but by breaking that rule, did it actually create a good whiskey? Well, the answer is yes, they did. They actually got multiple gold medals and they defeated in blind testing some of the best known brands of bourbon whiskey. And it all started by saying, what is the rule? What are the basic conventions that nobody will challenge? Let's come up by asking over and over different what if questions to challenge the conventions. So as a leader, you need to give per people permission to do that, but also model that as well, breaking the rules. You also need to give permission. Now, this guy you probably haven't heard of. He's not a CEO, but he was the leader of a team at Pfizer a number of years ago. This guy, Gordon, was the head of the cardiovascular franchise at Pfizer, and he had an employee who had a big, wild idea. And while the portfolio for cardiovascular was many billions of dollars and like a large company in and of itself, he may have felt like, I can't take a risk. I can't let this guy take time to pursue this big idea. But the big idea was around trapped intellectual property, was a pretty clever idea. And he said, you know what? I want to see this idea flourish. And while I'm not interested in developing it, I'm going to give you the air cover, the permission to develop it. So Gordon went out and he got him funding, he connected him with people and said, as long as you get your day job done, as long as you perform, I'm gonna give you all the support you need. And why is this unique? Most managers don't give permission. They're worried that it's gonna make them look bad. They're not thinking about how do I enable my people to innovate because they're worried that it's going to end up killing their portfolio and risk their job. Gordon was a great example of giving permission to allow the greater good, to allow for the organization to thrive. And this guy that he enabled, well, he went out as part of a team and developed a spin out from Pfizer called Springworks Therapeutics. 
They got over 100 million of funding and they've been developing drugs that were trapped intellectual property or shelved drugs so they could see the light of day and do some good. And it all started as a leader of giving permission when people need it. The last bit that I wanna mention is time. How many times do I hear people say, I don't have enough time, there's not enough time. And I know it's true, we're all busy. Productivity is at all time highs, but creativity and innovation can be at a low because we're so busy. You might find that your calendar looks like this and eerily looks a lot like that, like a barcode calendar. You have no time in the day to do it. But when we don't protect time, when we're not judicious about managing our time, we do not set aside the important segments to be able to create and to innovate. And that's why I love to borrow and adapt this from Stephen Covey, a simple little tool to ruthlessly prioritize your time and funding to be able to make room for innovation, separate what's important and what is urgent and bucket it in these. Do it for your people. Make sure that they have a perspective of what really matters because often, the first thing that crosses our inbox, the first thing that comes to our desk, that becomes the priority. We need to rethink and we need to purposely set aside time to innovate. Because if we don't do that, we don't allow ourselves to flourish. We don't let the ideas percolate. Absolutely critical, protect time. So remember, it's all about breaking rules, giving permission, and also protecting time judiciously and being ruthless about it. So those are the three things that we need to do. But there is one last point. I wanna leave you with this. All of this means precious little unless you have courage. Courage makes all the difference. In the words of the great psychologist, Rollo May, he said that the opposite of courage, it's not cowardice, it's conformity. Because even a dead fish can go with the flow. It's not, can, it's not cowardice. Everybody's going to have butterflies in their stomach. Everybody's going to be a little bit scared to do things different. Where there's risk and uncertainty, we can really be a little bit unsettled. But it's facing the uncertainty dead on, staring it in the eyes, what makes the difference between a real leader of innovation and somebody who's a pretender. Think about these people. Henry Ford, he could have kept going with the flow. Personalization, customization of cars, was really the way things were. He introduced the assembly line approach by borrowing this wild idea of taking the cotton gin in the meat packing industry and creating a systemized assembly line approach. Nobody had done it before. He had to take a risk. He had to have courage. The Wright brothers, man, first in flight. These guys had to have incredible bravery, tremendous bravery to be able to run an experiment to be their learning instrument. And it's not just businesses, it's also in life. Rosa Parks, who really changed the way people thought about race. She started and continued the conversation, having the courage to sit at the front of the bus and not in the back. And Steve Jobs taught us everything about being a learner, about being ruthless, but also being purposeful about how we innovate and thinking different. That's what it's all about in the face of conformity, in the face of doing what everyone's done before, in the face of being a knower, we need to embrace a learner's mindset. We need to have the courage to do it. And it ain't easy, because if it was, everybody would do it. So in the end, I want you to remember four things. Inspire purpose, create the conditions, break down barriers, clear the way for your folks, and be courageous have the bravery to do things that you didn't even think you could do. And that's what Leading Innovation is all about. I thank you for your time, for listening to me and joining, joining me here. If you want to connect, reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can email me or connect any other way. But thank you guys, and I wish you well. Go out and innovate.